right? What's Hello, up, everybody. <laughs> How you doing, hey, man? man? Good. Uh, you know, I like to think we're not getting older, we're getting wiser. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead, uh, tell everybody like what your name is, what do you do, and uh, then we'll jump into it from there. Sure. Uh, well, it's good to be here, and congratulations on the website. And you sound awesome, by the way. You sound like so professional. You got to give me some tips here. <laughs> uh, so I have a couple different positions at the moment. I've been in transition for the last two years, uh, but right now I am a research assistant professor at the University of New Mexico, which is in Albuquerque, beautiful Albuquerque. Uh, so I have a lab there called the NICE Lab, Non-Invasive Cognitive Enhancement Lab. Hmm. Uh, I have now recently moved to Tucson and I have a lab at the University of Arizona uh, there, I'm an adjunct professor, um, and I'm actually teaching classes, too. My lab in Tucson is called the Sima Lab, Sonication Enhanced Mindful Awareness Lab. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll dig into it, but both labs are interested in using technology to stimulate the brain, so I'm sure we can dig into those things. Um, I have one more position. I am the assistant director for the Center for Consciousness Studies which is one of the oldest centers that studies, it's a scientific study of consciousness and consciousness research. And we have the biggest and longest running conference on consciousness. It's called the Science of Consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it started in Tucson back in 1993 or 1994, I should know, I guess, being the assistant director. <laughs> um, but uh, we, it's just this big fun conference where we invite scientists and artists and musicians and People like Deepak Chopra come. We, we're really sort of, we open the gamut to anybody who's interested in studying consciousness and we kind of create a forum and a space for them. Hmm. So yeah, I'm very busy. I don't sleep. <laughs> sleep is important though, right? Well, apparently so. My girlfriend has a PhD <laughs> in sleep science and she's always trying to get me to go to sleep, but you know, I have fun which, stuff like this to do. Which we will have on. She will be, I think, our last episode of the of season one. So I'm, I'm stoked to talk to her as well. But so let's go ahead and jump right into it. Where did you grow up and, and what was your childhood like? Uh, well, you might not be able to tell it from my accent, but I was actually born in Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, and pretty much all throughout my childhood, I was a Southern boy. I am a Southern boy, true and true. Um, I lived in Mississippi for a couple years and then moved to Alabama, then Georgia, and then ended up in North Carolina, uh, where you and I were actually roommates, if you remember that long ago. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, those are good times. Um, okay, so how and when did you first become interested in, in the field of science? Uh, that's a good question. I've, I've really only been a geek, a science geek for it, really the end of high school is when I considered myself going in that direction. But if I actually think back um, to my childhood, I think it actually started at Catholic school, which is a little strange to hear probably. Um, but I had a, I had a nun. Um, I'm embarrassed. I don't actually remember her name. This is probably the one person who's changed my life more than anything. Um, but I, there was a nun at the Catholic school who really tried to instill the sense of curiosity in the kids. You know, every child, you know, you have a beautiful child. Every child is just born as this naturally curious creature. That, that's actually the way the brain learns. They learn mm -hmm. through repetitive, you know, exploration and messing up and breaking things. And the brain is just a very adaptive learning system. And so in a sense, I think we're all sort of born as these little scientists. We want to tweak the world. We want to control it. We want to explore it. And at some point, most of us get that beaten out of us by the education system, I right. think. Um, and for somehow this, this nun just figured out how to really instill that sense of curiosity in us. Um, oh, sorry, I lost you. Um, and, you know, I think that even though I, I wasn't really interested in science until high school, um, I think that sense of curiosity was there in my personality all throughout school. Um, and actually, most of school was really boring to me. Uh, I really hated school until about my senior year of high school. 
Um, so it, it's sort of strange. My, my sense of curiosity was always separate and I was always exploring topics like, you know, do aliens exist and are ghosts real? And as a kid, I was just interested in all these kind of weird topics. Um, and it wasn't until I started learning about science where that, that sense of curiosity and the scientific method started overlapping. And it was really in high school where I went, oh, there's a whole way of thinking about the world that has curiosity embedded in it, but actually you can explore it in a systematic way. And uh, that's definitely, I became a science geek that year and never looked back actually. Yeah, it's similar to me, man. Like I, I do, I, was, I started off with, uh, you know, aliens and ghosts and like all that stuff. And that really, I, I think, started piquing my interest into what was possible. And, you know, it just kind of, kind of encourages you to, to think that, hey, there's maybe there, there might be more out there than what you're thinking, like what you're fed every day, like, especially coming from a small North Carolina town, it's, you know, it's pretty you know, conservative in, in their viewpoints and say that they don't really expand much. So like having to seek that out on my own, I was a, that was a very big part. So it's cool to hear that you had something similar. Um, so what was your high school experience like? Um, I actually moved from Atlanta, Georgia to North Carolina in the middle of high school. So I was one of those transplants who had to start over and I, I sort of explored almost every click in high school. Of course, high, high school is very clicky, as we all know. And uh, for whatever reason, I was just a very curious person. I wanted to know what all the different clicks were. And so um, I just sort of made friends with all the different groups. And I, I sort of spent more time socializing and hanging out with people and learning from people than I did from school. Um, and so the first two years of high school, I think my GPA was a two point something. It, it was extremely low. And like I said, there was a certain point in high school where I started getting interested in science. And I realized in about my junior year that if I didn't start making straight A's in advanced classes in North Carolina, they call them AP classes. If I didn't make straight A's, I wasn't going to get into like the lowest college in North Carolina. <laughs> And so um, I started taking all honors classes. And I think for the first time in my life, I started getting challenged by school. Uh, not to say I'm some brilliant genius or something, because I'm not. I'm a pretty average guy in terms of intelligence. But, you know, I think school doesn't even really, it doesn't even challenge the average IQ person. It just like really makes you memorize and you get kind of bored. And so in these honors classes, I, I was challenged beyond my ability for the first time. And I just loved it. I think there's something in my ego that was like, I'm going to do good in these classes. And I also had to, or I wasn't going to get into college. And I took, my first class was an AP psychology course. And uh, the teacher started the class off and he said something like, every one of you in this class is going to become exactly like your parents. And I just like something in me was like, hell no, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to be like my parents. Right. And so I don't know something. He just, he got that little curiosity thing going in me where I was like, how can he say that? That can't be true. And then, you know, we talked about genetics versus environment, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And it was just in that class where I got like, oh, this is fun. I actually like being in school. I'm learning a lot. I'm doing well. Uh, it really just sort of awakened this part of me that I think was was there since childhood. Speaking of your parents, did what what kind of influence did they have on you early on? Um, my parents had me when they were in high school, actually high school and going into college, and so they had me at a very very young age. And of course, in some ways, that was hard for them. I'm sure more than me, um, but it also it meant that I had parents who were very young and vibrant and capable of like, you know, they took me everywhere. They would take me to football games at college. And uh, my dad was at USM in, in Mississippi when Brett Favre was there. So he would go like work out and Brett Favre would be there. So I had this very rich childhood and also a very sort of loving and supportive childhood. And even though there might have not been a lot of structure that, that some parents would have given, um, there was that sort of context of love. And I think that that's the foundation for giving a child a sense of security and a sense of like, the world is okay. I can kind of go out on my own. 
Um, so, you know, even though I had young parents, I was their first kid. They were making all the mistakes that any first parent makes, but you know, I, I still had that foundation. That's awesome. What about siblings? Uh, I have a little brother and a little sister. Uh, we are very, very close. Um, they are both artists. I, I'm sort of the weird one in the family. I'm the only scientist. And so I kind of, I kind of stick out. But uh, they are both very creative, very beautiful people, and we've we've all been very supportive of each other. And so, you know, each of us has chosen very hard fields. My sister is in fashion design, uh, actually in New York, um, and my brother is a jazz musician slash all around musician. And so, we've chosen these very hard paths. And I think uh, there's been a lot of trials and tribulations, and there, there's a lot of times where we want to give up on the things that we've chosen, but you know, for each of us, there's been this sort of sense that we help each other because this is what we love. And it's much better to do something difficult that you love than, you know, a nine to five job where you hate getting up and going to work every day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, cool. So after high school, tell me about your journey. What did you do? Um, what college did you go to right after? Um, so out of, out of high school, I only got into one college. It was Western Carolina University, which is in North Carolina considered the lowest of the four-year universities. But I think for me, it was a crucial stepping stone. Um, I, I think if I would have gone to something like Duke or Chapel Hill, I don't actually think I would be where I am today. Because Western Carolina, for one, is in one of the most beautiful settings that I've ever been in. It's in the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, in a little town called Kolowee, which translates as Valley of the Lilies. And it is just a magical place. It's right on the Tennessee, North Carolina border. And this time, um, <clears throat> I was like, actually dating my high school sweetheart, who I was dead set on marrying. I was going to marry her. We were going to have three children. We were going to have like a white picket house fence, and everything was going to be like perfect. But something in me told me, you know, maybe it's good to have the first year of college apart from her, just because I was like, I'm gonna spend the rest of my life with her. What the heck, it doesn't matter. You know, one year apart is gonna be good. So she went to Wilmington, which was all the way across the state. I went to Western Carolina, and that was the year where I really started internal exploration of like, who is Jay? What is he about? What does he care about? What is his ethics? What's his religion? You know, all these questions that you should be asking when you're that age. And I started reading um, the, what are called the transcendental philosophers, the romantic philosophers, if you want to call them that. So uh, Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Emily Dickinson. And I, I would literally take something like Walden, which is this book that Thoreau wrote. He went and lived on a pond for a year and he wrote a book about it. Um, I literally would take that on the trail and I would walk out, you know, as far as I could walk for a day or two and I would read in the, in the midst of the, one of the most beautiful forests in the world. And I think it was there that I, I really sort of connected again with that sense of curiosity of like, not only curiosity about the world, but like, what am I about? Curiosity about myself. Like, what is this? Why am I here? What am I doing? There's 7 billion people. Like, what am I going to contribute? this tiny little, you know, average person, like, how can I contribute something to the world? And I think for me, that was very crucial, because I really realized that I, I had a lot of work I needed to do on myself. And I didn't really even know how to do it. And so it kind of created this situation of like, okay, now, now I've re, you know, connected with that part of myself. Now I need to figure out what to do with it. And so it kind of set me on that path. Yeah, I spent a year there, and that's where we met, and it was an amazing experience, even though it was only for a year. I, I have to admit, it, it was, there's something about that spot up in the mountains that, that really does foster um, insightfulness, I guess is what I'm trying to say, in, in yourself, yeah. like self-reflection. Um, a, a lot of growth happened in that short year that I was there experienced a lot of things good and bad and and uh definitely I I remember I think it was one of the only places I've seen that really dove into um like eastern religion especially like native american 
uh, religion as well. And, and that was really fascinating for me. So that really started to open up that and psychology. Like I started getting more into it there. <clears throat> it really sparked my interest. But yeah, it was a great school. So what, what happened? Uh, well, I mean, I know what happened after that. So what happened okay. after uh, Western? After Western, well, you know, as a scientist, I, I'll say there's always like a third variable in science. Like I, I'm saying it was reading Thoreau that changed my life, but there could be a third variable, which is Jack Fortenberry, you know, maybe you or that, <laughs> right? So I, I think that's also a piece that in college, I really made some deep friendships like I hadn't had before because I moved a lot as a kid. Uh, and, and I think that was pretty hard for me to, you know, every, every two to four years I was moving because my dad had different jobs. And so college was also this time we met people like you, like really, really genuine people who, um, who were, you know, there to go on that journey with me. So anyway, I'll put that out there. Friendship is very important. Um, after college, I ended up chasing my high school sweetheart to Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, which is at the beach in North Carolina. So also one of the most beautiful places that I've ever lived. Um, this is like the first of the outer banks that kind of spreads up the coastline in North Carolina, um, up into Virginia. And um, I, I didn't really, you know, I had this kind of new curiosity thing going on and I, I kind of started taking a bunch of different classes. I had no idea what I was going to do, but I, I kind of knew that I was interested in questions about the mind, like how does the mind work? How does the brain work? What is this consciousness stuff? Like how does it, how does this three pounds of gushy stuff in my head create me? You know, that's really crazy to think about. And so I started taking philosophy classes. I started taking neuroscience classes and I started taking psychology classes. And within the first semester of my second year of college, it became really clear that like, that's what I was gonna do. Um, and I you know, ended up parting ways with my girlfriend. She went on a different path and we came to this, you know, what felt like a very adult c conclusion that we just weren't right for each other anymore. Uh, and and I, although that was very painful, it was also very like, okay, now I'm on my own. Now I gotta, I gotta do this, you know, this is all me. I can either fail or not. And if I fail, you know, that's fine, but it's gonna be on me. And so I started taking philosophy classes full time basically and really immersing myself in philosophy. So what would you say were some of your biggest obstacles that you had to, to get over to be successful in high school as well as college? Um, I am by nature a, a very anxious person. I think it's just my physiology. And going into philosophy, you had to get up in front of the class and debate. A lot of philosophy is like classical debate style, Socratic method with the teacher and debating each other. Uh, and also I took a bunch of logic classes where you had to literally symbolize an argument on the, on the board. This was chalkboards at that point. Um, you get up on the chalkboard, you put this argument in logic and you had to like, you know, say whether it was sound or not. Uh, that was extremely difficult for me. I pretty much was like, I'm going to give up on school because I can't get in front of people. And I just pushed through, you know, I, I did that thing that I was talking about where I was like, why am I here? I'm not here to look good in front of people. I'm here because I'm deeply interested in questions about the mind you know, and I don't care what these other people really think other than when I'm in front of them for some reason. <laughs> but, you know, when I go home, I'm not thinking about those people. I'm thinking about philosophy and I'm thinking about the brain. So I just sort of really dug deep and kept bringing myself back to this core thing of like, why am I doing this? Um, living at the beach became very easy to get into meditation and mindfulness. Um, so this was back in the early 2000s when the wave of mindfulness was hitting, you know, really hard in the United States. And so I also started a mindfulness practice. I started learning how to calm my, my crap down, you know, and getting control of my physiology. And, you know, that then started taking me even deeper into this sort of internal world, like trying to explore it. Hmm. Awesome. Um, so what, so after that, uh, after Wilmington, 
what happened did with your graduate degrees, like your master's? Um, well, in Wilmington, I actually worked in a neuroscience lab for a while. Uh, so in philosophy, I, 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 I started thinking like, I'm not going to understand the mind by studying logic and philosophy, um, even though that's been going on for a very long time. I started realizing I'm going to have to know something about the brain. Uh, neuroscience is a very, you know, not well developed, but it's been going on for a couple hundred years now. And I started sort of seeking out, you know, brain science and trying to understand that piece. So I worked in a neuroscience lab for a while and actually I was um, investigating the effects of MDMA uh, on the street. This is called ecstasy. It's a street drug that you take when you go to raves and ecstasy makes you fall in love with everybody around you. It makes you very happy. Um, I've never done it myself because I researched it, but talking to people who've done it, it's one of these sort of rave drugs. And so we were actually creating that in the lab and then giving it to rats. And we were trying to study the effect on the brain. And um, I started feeling like this wasn't the right thing to do to animals. Because <laughs> uh, <clears throat> basically we did this to them. We gave them a lot of X, like way more than any rave person would take, you know, and these rats were just like not having a good time. Wow. And so, you know, I started actually thinking like, maybe I'm not going to be a scientist because I don't like doing this to animals, even though it's important to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I started sort of thinking, maybe I'm not going to go to grad school. You know, I don't really know what I'm going to do with my life. I'm not really smart enough to be a philosopher, so I don't really know what to do. And I actually went to a science conference uh, right at the end of my undergrad career. I was presenting my research on the rats and I figured like, this is gonna be it. This will be my only science presentation and I'm gonna do something else. And it turns out that the Dalai Lama, who is the, the ex-Tibetan leader of Buddhism, uh, was giving the keynote address to a group of scientists, which was like very controversial. Some of the scientists were like, we don't want this guy. He's a religious figurehead. And like, whoa, you know, it's kind of crazy. And anyway, I was like, ready to hear whatever the Dalai Lama had to say because I was like I'm done with neuroscience I don't want to do this anymore and basically the Dalai Lama said in front of 15,000 neuroscientists if they could create a way to do a brain intervention so drill a hole in the brain or give some kind of drug or brain stimulator whatever it is if those neuroscientists could figure out a way to give him the effects of meditation without having to meditate he would do it. He said he'd be the first person to sign up for the surgery, this brain surgery to enlightenment or whatever you want to call it. Um, when I was in the audience, this like completely changed my whole life. You know, this was like, okay, this is what I'm interested in. You know, this deep exploration stuff. I was meditating at the time. I really wanted to help people. I, I wanted to stop hurting animals, which is the way I felt about it. Uh, even though that's important, I understand, whatever, I don't want to piss off the neuroscientists, but, you know, for me, it just wasn't right. And so here's the Dalai Lama, you know, basically the Buddha reincarnate saying, like, somebody should create a technology that helps us meditate. And then it just kind of, the light bulb went off, everything in my life changed. I said, okay, I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, and then I spent the next 13 years trying to figure out how to do that. Um, so I had to go to graduate school, I had to become a good scientist, I had to learn about the brain and all these different things. And finally, in the last two years, I was able to sort of transition to that research. Hmm. Okay, so, uh, so you, you, touched, you touched on a lot here. So let's, let's move back. What <laughs> happened to the rats? Uh, so usually in a neuroscience experiment, you sacrifice the rats. Um, so that's, that's the politically correct term, but you do something to them. You do, you give them this drug. You want to know how the drug affects the brain. Well, you have to extract the brain. You have to literally uh, cut it out of their skull. And I can, I can yeah. describe the details if you like. <laughs> I, di I didn't mean like, I meant like more what, what was the results of the study? <laughs> Oh, I got you. Okay. <laughs> you see, this is my relationship to this research. It's very gory. Um, 
In the research, we were interested in this concept called neurogenesis, which is your brain does actually make new neurons in the hippocampus and the olfactory bulb, so the, the smell center and the memory center. Uh, and so what we wanted to know is when you give this drug, the street drug, to the rats, do they create more cells than normal? Uh, the answer is that that's a very hard thing to study because like I was saying, you have to take the brain out, you have to, we actually uh, stained the brain with this fluorescent stain. Mm -hmm. And then you would slice with a, a very, very, very sophisticated meat slicer. <laughs> Um, you, slice, you slice up the brain micron by micron, and then you actually put the slices under a fluorescent microscope, which, which is very beautiful actually to do. And then the, the cells that you're interested in start glowing and they're, they're very pretty. Your, your listeners can look it up if they want to on Google images. And then what I did for two summers is every day I would go into the lab and I would count every neuron that was glowing. <laughs> wow. And I would like close my eyes and I would see these neurons and I would like dream about them. And they were like haunting my life. It's really bad. <laughs> um, and basically what we found is that under certain conditions, uh, taking MDMA does cause more neurogenesis up to a certain point. And then if you take too much, it actually makes less neurogenesis. And so it's, tox it's toxic to, you know, it's, it's okay to a certain level and then you hit the toxic level. So up until a threshold. Hmm. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So let's go back to the Dalai Lama experience. I mean, that how profound must that have been to be in the same room with the guy, much less, you know, you know, I mean, it's got to on you. It must have a big impact because it completely changed the course of your life. But I mean, tell me more about like that experience of just being there and, and the feelings that you got from that. Uh, that's a good question. So <clears throat> let me paint the picture of the room. This is uh, somewhere around five to 10,000 brain scientists, you know, the smartest, scariest people in the world, <laughs> in my view, <laughs> besides rocket scientists, right? Brain scientists and rocket scientists. So that this is like this giant room. The room is usually where they have like car shows, you know, these big giant car shows where they, Elon Musk shows his new car on the stage. That's the size of these rooms. And I've been to this conference many, many times. It's a crazy, everyone's talking and it, you just feel, you just, there's this cacophony of like energy and talking. Mm. When the Dalai Lama came on the stage, it was completely still. Like I had never experienced so many people like so calm and I don't know, he was emitting some type of energy or whatever you want to call it. I'm not into that woo woo stuff, but just having him present just like made everyone chill the F out, you know, and like <laughs> put their ego down for a minute and stop trying to prove themselves. And, hmm. and then when he said, you know, if you guys, you guys and girls in the audience can create a surgery or whatever to make me have the effects of meditation, I swear you could hear a pin drop in that room. Like you could have dropped a, a plastic pin and you could hear it across the whole room. It, it was one of those moments where I was like, oh, this is like, he's saying something that could like change the course of humanity if it's true. Uh, and he's changing, he's saying something that's like highly, highly controversial. You know? did, so, did you notice any, any backlash from other scientists after the fact? Uh, oh yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we, in neuroscience, we do surgeries, we do brain surgeries on humans. So m most of the people in that room already knew that, you know, we can't make you enlightened. We don't even know what that means in science. And mm -hmm. we don't even know if that's really a possibility, but we know that we can put an electrode in your brain and make you feel really happy. We can give you ecstasy. We can turn on certain memories. I mean, there's all types of things that have already sort of happened in brain science with humans. Um, they, they do brain surgery to treat Parkinson's, to treat depression, to treat uh, obesity, things like that. So, you know, we all kind of knew like what he was saying wasn't quite possible, but definitely within the realm of possibility in the future. And so, you know, a lot of people walked away like, wow, he, he just said something like very, very controversial. That's crazy, man. 
Um, yeah. All right. So after counting rat neurons, um, <laughs> that's, I mean, how mundane was, must that have been like <laughs> to go in and just literally <laughs> count every day? That's, that's brutal. Um, someone would, yeah, there's a couple billion neurons in the rat brain. So, <laughs> oh man. Um, all right. So, uh, you said, so what you worked at a lab and, um, like walk me through the process of get educational wise, your, your master's and, and doctorate degrees. Sure. So, uh, right at the end of undergrad, I started doing, uh, human research and, I applied to, to labs to like, I think I applied to 15 different labs to uh, basically kind of continue the research that I was doing. And I actually, my undergrad institution was considered a teaching school, uh, which is a derogative term by the elite schools, you know? So someone at Harvard would say, oh, you went to a teaching school, you know? Uh, but actually, the teaching school was really crucial to help me get into a, a bigger school. But when I applied to grad school, I actually thought I wasn't going to get in. And one of my advisors told me I wasn't going to get in. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, at this point, after seeing the Dalai Lama, I started formally meditating or, or doing mindfulness mm -hmm. in the sense that I went to, you know, learn how to do it. And I was sitting multiple times a week. And so uh, when I applied to grad school, I decided I'm probably not going to get in and that's okay. It's fine. If I don't get in, it doesn't mean that I'm failing at life or whatever. And so my whole preparation was like, this isn't going to happen and that's okay. And I'll have, I'll do something else. My life will be fulfilling. I don't have to be a scientist. And so I kind of let go after I applied, I sent all my applications off and I just meditated on the beach every day, actually. <laughs> and just really let go of Jay, the scientist, Jay, the person who teaches as a professor and all of that. And then I got into 11 schools, um, which was like, holy crap, now I have to pick which school am I gonna go to? And I ended up choosing the University of Arizona because they have both a good neuroscience program, a good psychology program, and uh, they had the Center for Consciousness Studies, which is what I work for now, actually. And I really wanted to go somewhere that was going to like really foster my curiosity and creativity, you know, that stuff that was really kind of fundamental to me. Um, and I also, I think like, I, you know, I got into a couple more elite schools and it just didn't feel right. You know, I really went, I went on an interview to each school and I really, being a meditator at that time, I really just sat with it and was like, how does this feel? You know, going to Yale, for example, made me feel very like, oh, I'm going to be a Yale grad, you know? And it made, like, made me like, very like, proud, but I actually didn't like the feeling of it. Mm. <laughs> and so Tucson, University of Arizona, was my last interview for grad school. And it just felt right. The desert felt right. The, the the center for consciousness that everything was just right and i was like okay this is where i'm gonna go and uh yeah i went to grad school um i i had two advisors because i felt like i was a little adhd and i, I needed two advisors <laughs> to kind of help me like you know figure out my path in science and i had this conversation with one of my advisors where i said i want to study consciousness and she's a very like honest and hard-nosed scientist and she was like, you can't do that. You're not going to get a job. And what is consciousness? How are you going to define it? How are you going to study it? How are you going to measure it? How are you, you know? And I really was like, whoa, okay. Uh, you know, this is, <laughs> and, um, you know, we basically made a deal where she said, look, you, you came to study visual neuroscience, which is what she studies. And vision is consciousness. You're consciously visual. You know, you're, con you're, you're conscious of the visual world. And so that is part of consciousness. And so, you know, you need to pick a problem which is tractable. The term in science, you want to have a tractable problem, meaning you can track it, you can measure it, you can study it. And so I really sort of immersed myself in visual science and like, how does the visual scene work? How does the brain pick out among all of the visual input, which is insanely complex. 
how does the brain sort of pick out the right objects and all of that stuff. And the deal is basically, if I can become a really good vision neuroscientist, improve myself and, you know, publish some good papers and get all the methods down, then I can study consciousness. <laughs> You know, and, and, and I had to sort of earn my way. And that was probably the wisest thing that, that she could have said to me. Because I don't think I would have been able to, to be as successful if I would have gone right into consciousness studies, right into meditation and mindfulness and that kind of stuff. That's a, that was a very um, smart challenge that she put ahead of you in a way. Like, that's a very clever. I like that. Um, so... Um, we're going to get to the audience Q and A's, but, but first I want to dive into like, what are some current breakthroughs in your field? That's really getting you excited that you've seen. Uh, oh gosh, there's so many, uh, the field of neuroscience is moving very fast, hmm. uh, in my own field. So I study mindfulness or what's called the contemplative studies. Um, we are getting to the point in contemplative studies where we're starting to understand how contemplative practice so mindfulness meditation yoga breathing exercises how these sort of internal practices change the body and the brain and that's very exciting because you know mindfulness is a thousands of years old meditation is thousands of years old they've been saying for a long time like this is good for you you should do this this will make you happier have a more fulfilling life you know you'll get more pleasure out of life food will taste better all this stuff you know, they've been saying that for a long time. And now science is starting to sort of validate some of that. And so for me, that's very exciting because it means, you know, we, we're taking the woo-woo out of it and we're, we're making it, you know, in a way where a Western scientifically skeptically minded person can say, okay, I want that. I want to be happier. I want to feel better. I want to be a better brother or a better father or something like that. Um, so that's exciting to me, but you know, the, the technology stuff is really where the, the science fiction part is happening. And even in my own lab, you know, we are making devices that are wearable, uh, non-invasive, meaning you don't have to drill a hole in the head, these wearable devices that can put energy directly into the brain and change the brain in real time. Um, and those things are coming. They're already here in a certain sense, but what we're doing now is we're actually reading from the brain at the same time. So read the brain, decide when the brain does something that's not healthy or, you know, if you're, if you're trying to focus or whatever, and then the technology will stimulate back into the brain to keep you on task or to help you if you have depression or opioid addiction or whatever it is. So that's very exciting to me because part of what I want to do is use mindfulness and technology to help treat things, uh, especially opioid addiction is one thing that I'm focused on in my lab. Mm -hmm. And we're getting to the point where we don't have to prescribe drugs. Like it, it seems silly to me to have to prescribe a drug to get you off of a drug you're addicted to. Absolutely. Uh, the brain and the, and the self can heal itself. And so we're trying to sort of get to that point. Um, but I think... And a larger level, what's coming is, you know, Elon Musk, Facebook, there's a lot of companies and scientists who are designing basically chips that will be implanted into your brain that like port the internet directly into your brain. <laughs> uh, and, and this is happening. This, that, this isn't happening in humans yet. It's happening in, in mostly rats and mice and maybe a couple monkeys. Uh, but they are, they have chips that are, you know, n micron size, neuron size chips that they're going to embed into the brain. That mean you don't have to type or speak anymore. We just, you know, me and you want to sync up and we just say, Hey Jay, what's up? And then all of a sudden we're having a conversation mind to mind, uh, through the internet. And there we're, we're at the very, very beginning of that kind of stuff coming. And so I am equal parts excited and scared about this <laughs> mm, yeah. uh, because I think it could really help humanity, but I also think, you know, technology takes us in weird places. And so, mm. you know, we're also kind of headed down this weird path 
And so for me, part of, part of my research and the way I'm trying to help mitigate some of the damage is to make that technology enmeshed with uh, in internal methods of self-exploration, you know, things like mindfulness and yoga and the things that uh, are, are designed to help us feel better and to, to experience the world in a positive way. Uh, instead of just porting YouTube or Reddit into your brain, <laughs> but you you know that's what's going to happen. It's like it's it's yeah, it's, it's really it, it boils down to how much porn can I get in my head? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, porn always leads the way for technology on the internet, but then the good stuff, you know, the positive and things grow around it. And so, what we're trying to do is grow the healthy, positive things you know, after all the other stuff happens, if you want to think about it that way, but really to embed it, you know, to say mindfulness and, and self-exploration and, and thinking about well-being and happiness, these can be embedded in the technology. And really that that's the goal of my lab is to say, you know, why, why let Elon, I really like Elon, he's, he's a good guy, but you know, it, it shouldn't be just one group creating the means to all this technology. It should be multiple ways and multiple things sort of embedded in it right it's 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 how the to foster the evolution of of that technology right right exactly and if we can show with you know in my lab what we hope to show is that you could use technology to stimulate your brain which is kind of scary sounding i know but you know if we can help guide the brain into a place of deep mindfulness you know what the dalai lama is talking about that's really what we're working on now if we can guide the brain into that space, so you get to feel what it likes, what, what it's like to be a meditator for 30 years, you know, the deep sense of happiness, the deep sense of well-being, the deep sense of peace, you know, that I, I think everyone wants that, even if you think mindfulness is a scary religion from Buddhism or whatever you think about that, you know, I think we all want peace, we want happiness, we want fulfillment out of life. And so if we can show that you can use technology to have that in a very, very deep sense, I think it gives one example. And then, you know, porn will happen and Facebook will happen and all these other things will be happening. But at least we'll have this example of saying, like, look, we can take people who are addicted to opioids and give them this deep sense of peace so they can get off the opioids. You know, it, it, it kind of just creates an example for people to choose is what we're hoping so okay let's 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 get a little geeky since you already went into kind of like what exactly you guys are doing tell me about some success stories from this um that you've seen that that you think will inspire people to you know be more accepting of of this kind of research so one group so, so basically all the studies in the beginning are different psychological and neurological disorders so one group that we're targeting to treat is people who have depression with high rumination. Uh, so most people with depression, they get locked in this negative thinking. You know, I'm Jay and I'm, I'm supposed to be so smart because I'm a professor, but I'm really, I said something stupid and then I, I'll think about it and think about it and think about it. So that's called rumination. What we know is that if you meditate, if you do mindfulness, you can reduce that rumination. And the more you reduce the rumination, the better you feel. It's like obvious, right? You're not being mean to yourself anymore. Uh, but the problem is it's really hard to get people with depression to sit on the meditation pillow and meditate for 30 minutes a day for eight weeks. That's how long it takes to get this effect. And so one thing that we've started doing is actually targeting this thing called the default mode network, which is if I just like, close my eyes and let my mind wander and start sort of thinking to myself. And maybe I'll think about something stupid I said to you. And now everyone thinks I'm stupid. When I start doing that, that's called the default mode in the brain. And it's a, a set of brain areas right in the middle of the brain. So we kind of know where they are. And what we're doing with our technology is we're shooting ultrasound into the default mode. And now this ultrasound is very low intensity. It's not damaging the brain. It's the same level of ultrasound you would do on a fetus. But we're putting that ultrasound into the default mode of people who ruminate. And we're down-regulating the circuit. And what we find is that these ruminators, um, you know, they 
well, we haven't we haven't actually done a, an official study, so this has been pilot testing so far. So I can't say too much, but the people who've tried it in the pilot study experience just a deep sense of quiet, like that they're sitting on the meditation pillow, they're learning how to meditate, so they're actually trying to meditate, and we're down regulating the default mode and that normal voice in their head that's just mean 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 just turns off and now they're like oh this is what mindfulness is about you know mindfulness is about now i can pay attention to the sound of the tree or the sound of the bird or whatever and they come out of it and they're like holy crap that's the first time in my adult life that that little voice wasn't being mean and talking to me it just stopped and then they get to sense, you know, then we train them while they go into that state. We train them how to do mindfulness and how to pay attention to positive feelings or whatever we're trying to teach them. And they start sort of seeing like, oh, this is the benefit of mindfulness. This is why I should fight with my brain in a certain sense to get to this quiet state. So not only um, depression, I mean, what other kind of illnesses do you think that something like this could tackle? Or even some, uh, or, or even branch off from this this uh, just the research you've done. So we're going to go after addiction next, uh, okay. probably opioid first, and we're going to teach them mindfulness while we do the do the treatment over two months. And the hope is that we can break the addiction cycle while we're giving them the internal tools to regulate their mind through mindfulness. Um, and if we can do that, I mean, addiction is a very, very hard thing to treat. You know, these, these folks have a lot going on in their life. It's, you know, the, the, the addiction comes from other things going on. So there's a lot happening. And we hope if we can show that this works on addiction, then that general paradigm of mindfulness plus brain stimulation can then be applied to almost any disorder. So anxiety, to overeating, to uh, chronic pain is one place we really want to take it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, in a sense, like the Buddha said, I'm not a Buddhist, but I think the Buddha was right about some things. You know, the Buddha said that all human consciousness is imbued with suffering. So, you know, chronic pain is a clear case of suffering. But, you know, if I go away from this conversation and I start thinking about how stupid I was on, the, on this call, that's, a, that's generating suffering. That's taking me away from talking to my girlfriend or being with a child or what, whatever you need to be paying attention to. And so, you know, the hope is that that general paradigm that we're creating can just apply to pretty much any situation in life. But yeah, speaking we're going to cure everything. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but speaking of, of, of like opiate addiction, are you talking about like, two parts physical dependency and and then the actual the the uh, addiction itself meant like mentally right that's a very good question so we're going to be working with an opioid clinic so these people will have there, there's like a one to two week period where when you're coming off the drugs you go through withdrawal and it's horrible um so eventually we hope we can treat that but we're going to wait for that period to subside because it's just hard. They're not going to be able to meditate while they're going through withdrawal. It's just, you know, we're being practical about it. So they'll come into the clinic. They'll have the support to get off the drugs for the first couple of weeks. And then when they're ready, they'll go into the study where we actually teach them mindfulness for two weeks or for two months. And they're getting brain stimulation about twice a week. And so we hope that this paradigm is going to actually sort of help them break the habit, you know, the, the triggers and all the stuff that sort of triggers them into craving for the addiction. Hmm. We hope we can break that. And then actually what we hope to do is give them a, an EEG system. So a, a way to read the brain waves that they take home and they continue to do the mindfulness practice at home. Because, you know, our real goal is not just to break the addiction, but to give them the tools in their daily life. And I remember when uh, when I was finishing up college, the the technology behind EEGs w was becoming you know much more affordable, portable. Um, it wasn't like just hooking wires and electrodes up to your brain anymore, right? Like, don't they have things yep. that that you can just fit on your head? Like, it almost like a like like 
prongs that you just like like a helmet thing that you just put on. I don't know how to yeah. describe it. Yeah, there's a company called um, Emotiv, E-M-O-T-I-V. Mm -hmm. And uh, they sell a consumer EEG. So you can get like 14 channels for a couple hundred bucks. And uh, you can program it to control your drone. If you have a drone, it'll control it with your mind. Or, you know, you can meditate with it. You can do all kinds of brain hacking stuff. Um, if your viewers are interested, there's actually a group called Consciousness Hackers. And Consciousness Hackers comes out of San Francisco, but now it's all across the world. And there are these local groups in every city, and they, they're people who want to buy an EEG and learn how to hack their brain, you know, stuff like that. So uh, definitely look it up, and you can go to these things and meet people who are talking about stuff that I'm talking about. Yeah, speaking of, before we get into um, the audience Q&A, do you have, let's say, um, first off, do you have any recommendations for uh, just general entertainment that you think would be not, like good for, for people, and then... In, then moving on to med like meditation material and then material more related to that and, and how it intertwines with neuroscience. Just any general recommendations. Uh, what kind of general entertainment you mean? Like, I don't know, whatever you're, whatever you're into now, <laughs> just for fun. Uh, I, I do a bit of coding and I like to watch TV. So a couple of the TV shows that are kind of around these topics, um, there's one called Limitless, which is a movie and also a TV show that I love. That's about this idea. This is a drug that the guy takes, Bradley Cooper, not any guy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Bradley Cooper takes and um, it makes him super smart. And that's essentially what I'm trying to do in my lab in Albuquerque. So, you know, it's kind of a dramatized version. Um, that's a fun one. Uh, one that I do watch that I recommend to people, um, but I recommend it with a lot of caveat. It's called Black Mirror. Um, most people are probably familiar, but it's a, it, it sort of takes the idea of different technologies and takes them usually in a dark dimension. So that's why I say be careful with Black Mirror. It can, uh, it can be a little bit depressing. Um, yeah, other than that, I usually watch space shows because I really like outer space and space exploration. So mm -hmm. any of those space shows. Uh, what about uh, for meditation? For mindfulness, uh, I will recommend um, an app called BrightMind. So that I work with a meditation teacher called Shenzhen Young, and Shenzhen is a very well-known mindfulness teacher. Uh, Shenzhen has a lot of videos on YouTube. So if you just type in Shenzhen Young, you'll see him on YouTube, and he basically just gives all of his content for free and teaches you a, a very practical Western scientifically based mindfulness practice. And uh, that's why I work with Shenzhen because it's it's it doesn't have a lot of the woo woo you know like reincarnation and all the other stuff. Um, I, I think any of the um, sort of apps on the app store that have really high ratings are probably good. One thing about mindfulness that we're starting to learn is it different types of practices work for different people. So if you try to do some mindfulness and it doesn't work, it's really hard, you know, just try a different type of mindfulness. There's like thousands and thousands of different ways to do it. Um, and I would really encourage people to just explore and find something that works for you. Awesome. Uh, what about uh, anything related to neuroscience? Uh, any kind of materials? Yeah. Um, you know, a good place to get up to date um, are are actually TED Talks. I, I get, I've given a TEDx talk. I don't really like the TED format that much, uh, but I do think that they are a good place to see the sort of uh, the regular TED Talks are a good place to see the sort of top scientists sort of in, in 10 to 15 minutes really giving the pitch of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So I do think that's a, a really good place to start. Uh, the other place is Reddit Science. Um, Reddit, the website, has a good science journal on their website. Hmm. And uh, that's a that's a cool place to see some good neuroscience and also to get some discussion about, like, what does it mean, um, that kind of stuff. Cool. Uh, the other fun place is Reddit, um, Reddit slash Futurology. Uh, future, like the future, Futurology. That one is, like, kind of all the cool techie science stuff that's coming. 
Um, and it, it, you know, I love to follow it. Some of the stuff, it, it, they're a little slanted towards like the future is going to be fine and everything's okay, uh, <laughs> which I don't, I don't believe in because I think climate change is imminent and we need to be talking about that probably before we talk about anything else. True. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's fun to think about technology in the future. Um, cool. All right. Let's, let's knock through some of these cue, uh, cues from the audience. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your dissertation and what it was like to write? Uh, sure. So my dissertation was actually on unconscious vision. Uh, and actually, I got to the top page of Reddit when I published my dissertation. It's my, my claim to fame. <laughs> um, and that's because what my dissertation was showing is that even if you're you're totally unconscious of an object that I show you on a screen, uh, the brain is becoming aware of it and the brain is processing it to very, very high levels, uh, which is something that wasn't really predicted by the brain models with MIT and Facebook. They have all these very fancy models of the brain. And, uh, you know, my dissertation actually showed that because of past experience, because of all the experience we have with the visual scene, that there's all this unconscious processing going on that we have no access to. Mm -hmm. um, and the more you dig into it, I mean, the, just on the retina, there's millions of bits of information that are hitting the retina on a 2D. It's actually two-dimensional on the retina. So that comes into the brain, and somehow the brain takes all of this information, figures out what's relevant to you, and then creates a 3D like hologram right in front of your face. Um, and so I, I think the reason my dissertation got like a lot of publicity and news is because it really was making a point that we kind of know what you're looking at in front of your face is a hologram. It's created by your brain. You're not actually looking at the world, uh, you know, and, and that we know that, you know, we kind of know that. Also, we kind of like feel like I'm looking at my desk. This is real. Now, actually, what you're looking at is a hologram in your brain that's constructed from the world. And so my dissertation was really sort of making that point in a certain sense, and the internet loved it, I guess. Cool. Uh, next one. I know this is not necessarily your research area, but how close do you personally think we are to cures for brain diseases like dementia and Alzheimer's? Uh, this is a very good question. I actually do work on Alzheimer's as well uh, in my, my free time. Um, I, we actually do have some drugs that are pretty good at treating Alzheimer's, but they're too big to get through the blood-brain barrier. Uh, so the blood-brain barrier is very good at keeping out big objects like viruses and debris and all the other crap that can be in there. Uh, but the problem is um, this drug works pretty well, but you have to like directly inject it into the brain. And uh, a lot of people, most people don't like to have holes drilled in their head or like a uh, you know, a needle into their cerebral spinal fluid in the back of their head, like matrix style, right? Mm. So, you know, I, we're getting close. I think actually, though, the problem with Alzheimer's is we still don't really know what causes it. And so it's really hard to find a preventative treatment um, until we really fully understand like the pathogenesis, like what, what actually causes it and how does it like form. What we're, what we're getting good at is actually saying like, okay, now we think you have Alzheimer's or you have dementia at least. Now we can give you this drug and the drug sort of treats that. Cool. Um, next question is, uh, someone in there says they work with patients. Um, and is there anything that you can uh, recommend to assist them with their pain instead of going up on the meds? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite biased towards mindfulness, as they can tell by now. <laughs> um, actually, Shenzhen, the guy that I work with, his most popular book is, uh, I forget the name, but if you look up Shenzhen Young on Amazon, look up Shenzhen Young in pain, you'll see his book. And uh, the people who use that for chronic pain swear by it. Um, so he's got basically a mindfulness practice specific for dealing with your pain. And, you know, I know that sounds like for people who don't meditate, I know that's really a hard thing to translate, but let me give you an example. I was at the dentist uh, a couple months ago and Shenzhen has this practice where if you feel like intense pain, instead of resisting it, instead of like 
tensing up around it and really not wanting it, you actually put all of your attention, every drop of your attention into the pain. And so I just started doing this. Like they, they actually didn't numb my tooth enough. And I was right on the edge of having a root canal. Hmm. So they actually had to pop my part of the crown off They'd take my crown off and they had to figure out if they needed to give me a root canal. So my root was exposed hmm. and they didn't actually give me enough Novocaine. And so I could feel like that crazy pain that like goes down your body and makes you. And I just, you know, I was like, all right, I'm going to try this. This is Shenzhen taught me this. And so I put all of my attention into that spot right there. And I swear to you, the pain just flipped and it became like the most bliss I've ever had. It was just like everything just broke up into bliss. Like I opened my eyes and I swear I was like tripping on drugs. It was like, everything is bliss. Everything is bliss. And then it was like, everything is pain. <laughs> and then just sort of like it flipped. It was the craziest thing. And so then I was like, all right, I'm gonna try that again. And then it was hard for a minute. And, and then I did it again. And then I just went into this like crazy bliss state. And the dentist actually was like, what the hell are you doing? And I was like, I don't think you Novocaine me enough. And he was like, I knew it. He was like, are you a meditator? And I was like, yeah, I'm a meditator. And he was like, you meditators. I hate it when you come in here. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had actually had other people, other meditators who had done that before. And it makes him a little nervous because you know, it's kind of weird. Yeah. But anyway, the point is that people with chronic pain can actually learn how to do that. And that means they don't have to take so much, you know, pain pills and all that kind of stuff. So huh. cool. I would recommend. Uh, another quick one. You don't have to elaborate on this. Have you met Elon? Uh, I haven't had met Elon. Well, yes, I've met him very, very briefly. Um, I've met some of his team and uh, I can't say much about what they're doing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I lived in the Bay Area for about six months and I, I got to meet people like him, a lot of other very interesting and powerful people. And when I tell you this technology is coming and they're working on it, I mean it. They are definitely working on it. Hmm. Yeah, I watched that Neuralink, Neuralink right? Is that what they're calling it? Like, yeah. yeah, I watched the the um, press conference or whatever they did. It was pretty interesting, a little scary, but um, all right. Next question: How speaking of how far will we go with the mind uh, with technology? He says I, I tried a drone controlled with uh, the EEG and it is pretty easy. So how, uh, how... that's that's a very good question. So you know, usually we get we see these technologies coming, like controlling a drone with your brain waves. Um, th that is actually not so hard, like, like that person saying, um, mm -hmm. but to go from that to like what Facebook wants to do, for example, like read your thoughts. So you don't have to type, which is very scary by the way. Yep. Um, but <laughs> you know, the, the sort of getting from thinking about moving, which is motor to thinking in general is a much harder problem. And so even if Elon succeeds in putting electrodes in your brain, you know, circuitry in your brain, and there's one circuit for every neuron, say something like that, we would have no idea what to do with all of that data. And so, you know, even though I say like things are coming, you know, get ready, we still know very, very little about the brain and how the brain creates consciousness. And so, you know, we are just at the very beginning. It's like, you know, where medicine was two or 300 years ago. Like that's where we are for consciousness studies, mm. but like we're actually on the way, you know, which is kind of the exciting part and you can take part in that. So, you know, I think what we're going to see is these very basic sort of motor brain reading things. And then very slowly over 10, 20, 30, 50 years, maybe then we're going to see like, Oh, it's going to be like so weird. We're not going to know what it is. Like when me and you are old, the world's going to be so weird. We're going to be like, what is this? This doesn't yeah. even make any sense anymore. <laughs> if it's, if it's not on the way out with climate change, like you said. That's true. Yeah. I think yeah. Uh, we, we're going to have to power all of these devices and we're going to have to figure out a new way to do that. I think. Like quick, like now, like yesterday and the day before. <laughs> yeah. I think we probably have 18 months to a couple of years to figure this out. So Let's I don't get on think so. <laughs> I, I I would like to have faith in uh, our leaders, but I just don't see it happening. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's not get too uh, <laughs> too out there of climate change. I know me and you could probably go on for a while. Uh, so what well, last yeah. last question? What was it like doing the TED talk? 
Uh, the TED Talk is the scariest thing I've ever done. <laughs> um, yeah, they, you know, they, they make you memorize every line, which is very difficult. You know, I, I, I just, I outline my talks, but I don't memorize it like an actor, you know? Right. And uh, they make you rehearse it a lot. There's this whole process. You start writing your TED Talk months and months in advance. And so in one sense, it was like very anxiety provoking. because I was like, oh my gosh, this is like a lot of pressure. But it was also a really, really good learning experience because they make you like really figure out what's the core message of like Jay. Like what is Jay really trying to portray to the world and, and the research that Jay is doing? Like why? Like what's the story and why is it interesting to other people? And I was actually starting to read the new climate science as I was going through this. And so I, I was starting to get a little scared, you know, which is, I think, normal. It's rational to, to read that. But I also started sort of trying to develop, um, sorry, getting a call. I was also trying to develop, like, my story. Like, why am I doing mindfulness research? Why do I care so much about helping all everyone, humanity, suffer less? Well, it's because suffering is coming, and it's already here. And so, you know, the world's going to change, which is fine. That's what it does. It's going to get hotter. I live in Tucson. It was 113 degrees today. It was really, really hot in Tucson. But that's okay, because I have a mindfulness practice, and I was walking outside, and I was just feeling the heat on my skin, and that was helping me deal. And so the TED Talk really helped me figure that out. Like, that's what I'm trying to help people do. I'm trying to give them a way to deal with their life, which is, even if climate change doesn't happen, which I hope is true, I hope it's completely alarmism and it's totally a, a hoax or whatever, that would be great. But even if it's not, people are still gonna suffer. And so my life is about trying to bring technology to people so we can reduce suffering. And the TED Talk was really good at helping me hone that message. Would you ever do something like that again? Uh, totally. I hope, I hope my life leads me to doing more of that because that means I'm, I'm doing something that people want to hear about. Um, yeah, you know, I would actually suggest to people to, to go to Toastmasters. Because you can you can give your own TED talk at Toast. I would I would say do that because it really makes you sort of dig down into like what are you doing? Why are you here? What's your purpose? Hmm. Cool. All right, man. Well, I'm gonna let you impart some last words of wisdom. If you could tell everybody that's listening to this on the video or podcasts or however many years in the future future selves, uh, what would you say to them? Uh, you know, I would say to them, figure out, find your curiosity, you know, figure out what that is, what, what gets you going, what gets you interested in the world and, you know, follow that, like that, that's what makes us human, it, especially as we become robotic cyborg, whatever, you know, all this, this stuff is going to happen in our lives, but there's going to be a core thing that is you. And I think really getting in touch with that, finding what you're curious about, and then trying to figure out how to use that to help people or help your family or help yourself. You know, it's, it's gotta, you gotta turn that curiosity into helping. And, and, I, and I think that's a really crucial component for feeling connected to the world and feeling connected to everybody else. So, you know, the world's gonna change and that's okay. The world's always been changing for humanity. But what we've always done is we've been curious, we've adapted and we've been together. And so I, I think that's really the message to to figure out how to do that for yourself. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I I'm going to have to have you back on for sure. So we'll get into a lot more. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to have you back on sometime and we'll go over current topics and just get really nerdy with everything. Okay. <laughs> I'd love to nerd out. Let's uh, do it. I have a nerdier pair of glasses, so I'll put those on. Yeah. We'll yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me too. I'll wear my glasses and we'll, we'll, we'll go, we'll go all in. <laughs> All right, man. Well, you have a great night and thank you so much for coming on and, uh, and we'll holler at you later. All right. It's my pleasure. All right. Have a good one. Bye. All right. On this train and get this over with. I get it over with. Hmm?